Thanks, Lori, and welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear back there in the back? Okay, if I start to fade, just put your hand up or something. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, my, I'd like to introduce the rest of me, which is that I'm a dad of six children, all successfully through college, and the last one getting married, and 13 grandchildren. So somehow, even though I had Asperger's, I knew how to do the rest of it, at least functionally enough to get by. <laughs> and so I think I might be the only one that has to be on the, on the I'm looking at someone else's suspect, or he says, okay, yeah. Okay, there's two of us in, on the panel. Um, so I'm gonna sort of like set you up for the rest of them, is what I'm gonna do. And uh, I wanna talk to you, I, you got my notes. Did everyone get my notes? Okay, I don't know if you can figure them out, but maybe you can figure them out as we go along. So, um, this first one stands for shift. It's a car, it's a shifter for your car. And what we're talking about is shift happens. Okay, so when you're, when you're, uh, uh, it's a story from a student at our Berkeley Center who, during his, his parent meeting, started to say, um, oh, had all these problems, and he was saying, well, you know, S happens, and I said, no, shift happens, Sam, and and so we had this whole discussion about it, and and then I got him a T-shirt that said shift happens on it. And, and it, all the students wanted them, so we started making them. So that's a little story for them to start you out with. The second one on, on your list there, and I have to 15 minutes, so I'm gonna cut right through tonight. What does that stand for? It stands for the parents and professionals role it is to introduce uh, the right services and quality mentors to their students. So that is, a, you need to be a clearinghouse and a headhunter for your student, okay? So that's what that's all about. And to allow the student to make positive change, you're gonna to have to set them up. I mean, I'm sure that Susan's gonna talk about how she set up her daughter. She had to go and make sure she got the right school and the right services outside the school. You know, so you, there's a lot of things that parents have to do, not run their lives, but be a clearinghouse and a headhunter. That's your job. And so what's the third one? That's the law of regression or diminishing returns. And what that means is that during junior high school and high school, parents' activity in helping their students helps them. But after high school, it hurts them. The diminishing returns. Like you think, oh, I'm doing this. And you keep doing it, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's actually contributing to the problem. So the same thing you did that worked positively in junior high and high school actually hurts your student after high school. And that's a hard one to accept, but it's true. And I'm sure other people will speak to it. So let's go on to the next one. What's the next one with the chainsaw with the umbilical cord? That's the steel umbilical cord that's connected from your child to you, usually the mom, the, the ASPE mom or LD dad or whatever. And so it's hard to cut that. It, it requires a, a, a diamond blade and has to be cut by both sides. The student is usually more eager and easier to cut it than the parent. Surprisingly so, you know, the helicopter parents they talk about? Well, that's a problem because you've created this relationship that's sort of um, symbiotic with your son or daughter, that one has a learning disability, and it becomes a problem after they get out, when they get to a certain age, it actually can hamper them. So the student will not form relationships with peers at college, or he or she will not, their social development will suffer if you're their primary date or social connection. And even though you're addicted to this child, you gotta let go, because they have to learn to stand on their own feet. So the next one, what's the, the next one? It's two students carrying large bags of whatever. So this comes from a parent. I did a parent evaluation with a parent from the Berkshire Center in Massachusetts, and a parent said to me, you know, Dr. McMahon, I said, what can we do better? And she said, this is after a kid graduated. She said, you need to let them struggle more while they're with you. So we can't make it too easy for them while they're with you because they need to learn what it's really like when they get out. You know, producing their own money and being able to stand on their own two feet. So that's what that one represents. And um, 
Uh, what's the next one, the DM? That is the problem with people on the spectrum. We resort, we, we go back to a default mode. Our default mode is what? Isolation. So I don't care what you did for your kid or what the parents did or the professionals. The default mode on the spectrum is isolation. So unless they internalize themselves that they're gonna to have to change their whole life and try new things, they're gonna go right back. It's like, remember the Flintstones when they let, they let the, the dog out the front door and he goes in the window? That's what you're gonna experience. And that's what they'll do to themselves is, you know, they'll hide out. So they have to break that up. And what's the next one? The next one is that you need to support yourself first. It's like, you know, when you go on the airplane, it says, if the need for oxygen is, you know, put it on your favorite child first. You know, then, I mean, after you put it on yourself, then you put it on your favorite child. Because you have to put it on your fir yourself first. So, if, it, if you have a crazy mom, you have a crazy child. If you have a calm mom, you have a calm child, generally. And so, you need to do for yourself what you want your child to do first, which means get a life. And that means get a life outside of them, and they will start to pick up the ball and run for themselves. It's hard medicine. Parents don't like to hear it, especially moms get mad at me when I say this to them sometimes. What do you mean? If I don't do that, he will you look at where you'd be right now. And I said, well, you have to do it. If you don't start doing it now, when are you going to do it? You know, when they're 35? And it's too late. So... The next one is not the World Trade Towers, but that's what it is, is a bar graph. And you see that there, they're equal. That bar graph represents the more that you let go, the better that they do. The more that you empower them and stay out of it, the better, the more they're gonna learn. After you reach that age, you still have to have other people around them that can help them. But did you ever notice, those of you who have older children, like I do, some guy or some woman will tell your kid to do something that you've told them their whole life and they wouldn't do it for you and they'll do it for that guy. And you look at that weird person and you say, why would she do it for him or why did he do it for that guy? But you say, well, I'm glad she's doing it, but I don't know why she did it for him when he told her. But that's what happens. So, okay, what's the next one? It's a can of soda, right? We tell our students, take a soda. This is what you're gonna use when a student calls and asks for a solution or to be rescued. You're gonna say, take a, drink a soda. In other words, stop. They need to observe what's going on. That's the O. Deliberate, and they can use the donkey rule, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and they can deliberate, and then they take action. So they have to use that process. So if you wanna ask the student to problem solve instead of giving them the answer or rescuing. Let them do it for themselves in a safe environment, like, you know, with their counselors or any of these people or us, or, or you know, and you gotta encourage them to do it their own thinking and their own actions and so self-advocacy. So the donkey rule, what is the donkey rule? Does anyone wanna guess? And CIP staff have to know it or they're, they get their fired. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so if five people call it a donkey and you're still calling it a horse, then don't be a jackass and do what they say. It's a common sense rule. It's why I have six CIPs and not one of them, because I use the donkey rule, because I'm such a stubborn, opinionated, judgmental person that nothing, no other advice could get in there. So now when I use your microcomputers to make a decision and say, hey Jim, what do you think I should do on this? Karen, what do you think I should do? Lori, what do you think I should do? And you know, and then I take those and I say, okay, well, I guess I'll follow what they say, even though I was gonna do this other thing. Then I get somewhere. Or I, once in a while I override the donkey rule, but at my own, you know, peril. <laughs> because I'm usually wrong, and uh, with social things anyway, usually. So I have to count on them steering me. Someone's got to give me uh, like a one minute flag at least because I can go over easily. You're good. I'm okay, he put zero up, I thought, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what's the next one? WWGT, when will we get there? And that's what parents ask. How long, oh Lord, am I gonna have to deal with this kid? 
Well, just put your seatbelt on because you're in for the long haul. That's the bad news. The good news is that these kids like me, and I was gonna speak for Brian, but he can speak for himself. We're slow learners, but we learn very, we, learn, we change forever. And we have a different profile, a different learning profile, but once we get it, we do pick it up, but we, we learn very slowly, you know? Uh, and um, so we're gonna learn for a long time. And uh, it often takes till 30 for us to find our niche. And I was doing adolescence at 45, and that's not good in your marriage, by the way. And, uh, you know, or at your work, work site. But I've had to, like, go back and do the developmental work. I missed high school, basically, because I was too responsible. So I didn't do the fun things that everyone else did. So I have to go back and do that work. You know, that therapy they used to have where you get down and crawl, and that, and, you know, like you're a baby, and then you work your way up to developmental stages. I had to sort of do that over after my diagnosis and sort of look back and re reframe childhood and decide what was what happened and how I could do better and how I could change it. So I've done a lot of it. I allow myself to travel and have fun and do things so that I can get that out of my system. Uh, okay, the next one is a door with a W on it. That's the willingness to engage. This is something you have to drive into the skull of your learning disabled or Aspie child, that they need to have willingness to engage and try and talk and speak and ask what they need because they're not gonna get anywhere if they're on their own. So they have to have that it's critical for growth as, um, and it's called cognitive flexibility. That's the hallmark of what we wanna teach our kids. Because once you're flexible enough to listen to other people's opinions, no matter whether they're a Jew or a Muslim or whatever, because I wouldn't do it 20 years ago. I was a Catholic, and if you weren't Catholic, I wasn't going to be around you or anything else. And, you know, I'd listen to you. Okay, three minutes, good. I can do this. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this goes for parents as well as students. Working as a team member, learning to form alliances, and then learning to form partnerships is how we get along in relationships, how we get along at work. Yes, you can isolate yourself in a cubicle on Wall Street, like my friend who's on the board of AANE, who got uh, diagnosed at 63, and make a ton of money and retire early, but she, he couldn't keep a relationship. But he was able to, in that little cubicle, make a lot of money for his company. So the next one is PCP, that's what's, um, What's a, this is a person-centered plan. You have to have a person-centered plan. All of our students have them, and we do it in our high school summer programs, too. What supports the student and parent need to reach, you notice I said parent need to reach the goal, because the parent might need to be in therapy at the same time the kid's getting help, because you've been through the mill, too. And remember, the Asperger's doesn't fall far from the tree, so that means one or you, or both of you, or an uncle or someone has probably the same learner disability as your student has, or some variation of it. So that means it's a family system. Um, who to partner with, what supports are needed. So you need to have a plan about that. Okay, I got the three left, and I think I can do it. The Tulip Garden. So I like to talk about a Tulip Garden, because in early May, you'll have a lot of tulips bloom. In I mean, a few of them, anyway. In the middle of May, you have a whole lot of tulips bloom, at the end of May, you still have tulips bloom. So the late bloomers, even though I'm a late bloomer, it doesn't mean that my flower is not gonna be just as beautiful. So some of you students out there, I know there's, there's a lot of students here, you know, just have to be true to yourself and you'll bloom eventually and you'll be just as good. It won't, it's just different. because we have a different profile. So um, I wanted to say thanks everyone for coming and the last, Part of it, the Think Positive Stones. When you, and you before you leave, you can get one of the Think Positive Stones. These are a tactile reminder and a cue that you can put in your pocket or your purse to to remember to shift, to change your attitude, to um, to uh, get rid of negative thoughts, and also to get rid of your limiting beliefs that keep you from achieving your success. So uh, I'm gonna pass it off to our illustrious panel here and we'll talk at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.
recap my neurological resume. <laughs> Asperger's and ADHD is just the tip of the iceberg. I also have dyslexia, dysgraphia, and a whole host of sensory challenges. And in spite of all that, I've managed to author four books, and I have my own business. And the reason I accomplished so much of that, not knowing any of this until I was an adult, is because I had the privilege of being raised by two stubborn mules <laughs> who taught me that if you want something, you go get it. You make it happen. You don't wait around for somebody else to bring it to you. My father was king of the Aspies in our family. <laughs> Nothing could stop him. He would work 12, 15 hour days without eating or even going to the bathroom. I'm not recommending this as a success principle. I'm just giving you an example of how he conducted himself. So what I saw is a man who couldn't be stopped. He wanted to do something, he did it. It was very difficult to make excuses within that context. I also happened to be privileged enough to be a 24 year cancer survivor. So when you are 18 years old and you go through that, it kind of kicks the cant out of you. Because when you stare death down and you survive, what on earth do you have to be afraid of anymore? Not a whole lot. So I was able to embrace that and take that into a young adult life, but still having all of these struggles I couldn't explain. Why was it so hard to read a page and absorb the material? Why did I have to read it four and five times and still not know what it said? Why, when I had the best of intentions and tried to connect with other people, that I still never failed to tick them off somehow? Why, when I would compliment a pretty girl, would she say I was being rude? There was a point where I just kind of gave up on friendships and lied to myself and convinced myself that I prefer being alone. I don't need people. That was a lie. I desperately wanted connection. I desperately wanted people. But I resigned myself to not having them in my life. Because every time I tried to bring them in, it hurt. Then I happened to stumble across a fellow wallflower, another nerd out there in the pasture. We found each other, and our mutual neediness made us decide to get married. <laughs> the best thing to come out of that marriage was three wonderful young men who happened to all be on the autism spectrum, and the younger two also have ADHD in various varieties. And it was through them that I learned about my own neurological eccentricities. And having to teach them what they need to know to succeed and be effective in this life, when I myself was still incompetent in those areas, required me to step up in a bigger way. Because we all know the school systems are very hit or miss when it comes to this, yes? Some have it together, some are trying, some frankly don't give a crud. So when my kids started out, my oldest one, he was with the not give a crud crowd, who wanted him to be medicated, sit down, and shut up. They didn't want to give him sensory accommodations, they didn't want to give him any kind of assistance that would help him manage that space. He effectively imploded. He had meltdowns several times a week, would run from the classroom, and sometimes successfully run from the building. I was called from my day job repeatedly to pick, pick him up and take him home. After a while, I got fed up waiting for them to step up and knew I had to. But first, I had to get to understand myself. What did my own neurological system teach me? How had I made it this far in life without knowing I had all these challenges? Because people ask me that all the time, how did you do it? The psychologist who did the assessments on me that helped me pinpoint all of these things. His first question was, how the heck did you get through school? How did I get through life? I essentially boiled it down to what I refer to as the three core competencies of life. The three R's. They're not the same as the three R's in school, which are read, remember, and regurgitate. <laughs> the three R's I'm referring to are responsibility, resourcefulness, and resilience. So what does responsibility mean? It doesn't mean it's your fault and you better own it. That's blame. That's what our kids typically hear. They are to blame for their negative behavior. People confuse those far too often. 
What does responsibility mean to you? Responsibility means complete ownership of your life, complete ownership of its direction. It means a decision to be proactive, to take steps, to take action, to create things. Not to sit around and wait for them to happen. Not to wait for them to come to you. Responsibility means you own everything happening between your ears, whether there are misfiring circuits or not. You don't blame your challenges, you don't blame the world, you don't blame anything. If you're gonna create something out there in the world, you've gotta own it. Self-advocacy isn't just about asking for what it is you need. Self-advocacy is also preparing to educate the world as to why you need it. Why it's not an excuse. Why it's a justifiable need. And how if that accommodation is granted to you, then everybody wins. The teacher, your peers, whoever benefits from that result. By backing you up, you can be better for them. Then there's resourcefulness. Resources come in three forms. People, places, and things. Michael talked earlier about partnerships. We live in a community, a society. Our number one resource is each other. We were not put on this planet to go it alone. There are times when we allow others to lean on us and times when we must do the leaning. There's this myth out there in the Spectrum community that it's weak to ask for help. I work with students over the years who say, my friends don't ask for help, I shouldn't have to either. I look at them stunned and say, what makes you think they don't ask for help? Because I never see them do it. Well, my question to them is, do you ever see them take a shower? No. Is it reasonable to say they do it? Maybe some not as often as they should. <laughs> but you know they do it. You see, your parents ask for help. You yourself ask for help whether you don't know it or not. But asking for help is, again, the number one resource. In fact, I'll give you the universal principle for why help makes us better and why help to each other is why we're here. I call it my rule of complementarity. It goes like this. My strengths are the reasons you need me, and my challenges are the reasons I need you. We're here to complement each other, to balance each other out, to create that unique synergy that we only can when we come together. And that's just utilizing each other's resources. Places. What places can you go that are resourceful to you? Let's say you're in a place that is sensorily overwhelming and you need to get out of there. You go to a place that's more calming. Let's say you've been in an office all day. Again, phones ringing, people getting on your case. You take a nice long walk outside, feel the breeze. <coughs> It's a resource to you. It's a new experience. It touches your senses in a whole new way. Then you have things. Even reference to exercise balls. The ones you can bounce on, the ones that you need to squeeze in your hand. Things can be knowledge. It can be a little pencil that you fidget with. It can be the internet that helps you find the answers that you so desperately need. We are surrounded by resources all the time. Anybody walk here tonight? How'd you get here? You drove. The car was not your only resource. Everybody that was involved in putting that thing together so you could use it are resources to you. You are connected to everybody that was in that chain of events. The people that pumped the oil out of the ground, refined it, shipped it, and brought it to your local gas station and charged you too much for it. Those are all resources to you. Then there's resilience. Resilience is the art of getting up instead of giving up. 
It's about bouncing back and weathering whatever storm life sends your way. Now, I know this is a room filled with youngsters, right? But when you count whatever age you're at now, you must acknowledge that every single day of your life, you got up, and whatever happened to you, you got through. And you got up the next morning, and you kept going. There are so many people I've come across that I can't do it, it's too much, it's overwhelming, I, I, I don't know what to do. Really? Your history contradicts that statement. Your history tells you that every single day you've gotten up and you kick butt in some way. You found a way to make it work. You took responsibility for getting through that day. You somehow found the resources to allow you to solve those problems or at least hang on. Because maybe that problem isn't going to get solved today. Maybe it'll be tomorrow or even next week. But you at least found the resources to hang on. And you kept going. You bounced back. There's been some conversation tonight about the importance of letting go. <clears throat> there are a lot of things to let go of. One of the most important things is those limiting beliefs. The blame. The can'ts. The excuses. The rationalizations. You cannot build a life on those things. You build a life on your dreams and your passions. Your abilities, your strengths, your confidence. When it comes to branching out into college, then the workplace, we know that as members of the spectrum, we are specialists, not generalists. The educational institutions of our world teach us to be Swiss Army knives. No, we're just a knife. One of the, the best parts of my parents' legacy to me was that they were entrepreneurs. They taught me every day of their lives that you can do the one thing you love and you can monetize it and make a living that way. My dad, who to this day can't have a conversation more than 10 words or so, wouldn't survive in an office environment on his best day. Probably would not get through an interview. <clears throat> but he can navigate anything electrical with complete mastery. He turned that into a career. He raised four kids on it and put me through college. Using his own resourcefulness, his own passion. He also had my mother, who was very ADHD, very social, and could handle the front end. He was able to do his strength. She was able to use her strength. And their unique synergy created that business. I am an entrepreneur. My kids are seeing me be resourceful. They're seeing me not have to necessarily fit the, the understanding of what success looks like in order to make a life for yourself. It isn't about going through interviews. It isn't about wearing a suit and tie and following the story that is typically set for you. That's somebody else's story. We are trailblazers. We are redefining what it means to contribute to this world. Many of us are going to do it in an entrepreneurial way. There is some giftedness in each of us, especially in this era of mass communication and the internet and whatnot. There's something we can monetize. Somebody who has a fantastic eye for photography can sell his photographs as postcards, as things you would hang on your wall, as things on the side of a mug. And there are websites out there that will help you do that. It's just a matter of thinking more resourcefully more innovatively. And last thing I want to touch on is the idea of independence. My thinking on this is that independence is a myth. Because when you look at the definition of independence, it means to do without help. How on earth can we possibly succeed without help? I am not speaking to you tonight independent of this microphone. I did not get here tonight independent of my car. I don't achieve anything in my life independent of the people in my life. Success does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs in a context. It occurs in a relationship, in a family, 
in a classroom, in a community. We cannot do it alone. We were not meant to do it alone. We are in it together, and we must be in it together. That's the only way we're going to make it. It's been a privilege talking to you. Thank you. and I have copies of them here so you can all look at them and if anybody wants to buy one of course I love that um, but one of them is on um, relationships adult relationships between someone on the spectrum and someone who is not on the spectrum and uh, it's called the partner's guide to Asperger's syndrome and I think that Michael and Brian here are great examples of the fact that there are so many stereotypes that have been broken in the last 20 years about people on the autism Asperger spectrum of different, different learning styles. And um, I was just, not just, two years ago I was at a South American conference for disabilities and they had an autism expert come from Spain. And people were asking him um, if it was possible for people with autism and Asperger's syndrome to have adult relationships that were long term. And he said, oh no, they're not interested in that. And of course, I, not being very shy, just about <coughs> fell off my chair and kept my mouth shut but went over to him afterwards and said, I think maybe you better understand that I have interviewed over 100 couples just for one book on this subject, and these were people I could access relatively easily. So uh, that's just not true. Um, many years ago, we finally started saying that we weren't going to tell the Brian Kings, the Michael McManmans, and the other people that we will never know who have some form of autism, how they feel and what they're supposed to think and do. We started opening this and not using this as much. It's still hard for me because this, you know, this just goes, I, I, you know those chattering teeth? I think I'll be buried with some of those because it's kind of neat. But um, I've had the privilege through my work at MAP Services for Autism and Asperger's Syndrome to listen to families who are coping with um, a loved one who's different than the norm of society in some form of autism. And I've listened to people with autism talk to me about their hopes, their dreams, their wishes, and their problems. And so it's been a very good learning experience for me. I'm the parent of a daughter who has autism. She was diagnosed when she was three years old at a very venerable institution, the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. At that time, she screamed, she was three. She screamed about 12 hours a day. She could collect nouns and verbs and speak them, but couldn't communicate with them. She had no eye contact, and she seemed to completely not notice her peers. She had never looked us in the eye, ever, no matter what we'd done. And um, when she got diagnosed, they said her, di her prognosis was guarded. Don't you love that? I mean, how many people here have been in a room, you don't have to raise your hands, and, you know, waited for the big pronunciation? And... Um, usually gets garbled, garbled in a lot of technical language. We were lucky. We're, we were in a place where they really tried to explain what was going on, why they came to that idea, and told us we were good parents. That was 1975. That was very rare then. Most professionals thought that we moms were to blame for our children being different. And um, now Beth has a master's degree a regular, non-adapted master's degree in church music and liturgy. She speaks three languages. She sings professionally and lives by herself in a rented house. Um, she just landed a new job as a Spanish translator for the Autism Society of Indiana. Um, so she way far surpassed what we ever thought she'd do. She's had a serious boyfriend, uh, she loves music and dancing and people. We never have to worry about her opening the door to other people. We just have to worry that she knows no strangers sometimes. Um, and she's candid, so sometimes she'll just say what she thinks, even when I don't want her to. Isn't that something? She is not my puppet, Michael. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and I have to say one thing as a mom. First of all, um, Brian can tell you better than most people I know that there are just as many caring dads out there as there are caring moms, and just as many dads who feel an umbilical cord and who worry every day of their lives and would probably cut off an arm if it was going to help their kid. So it's not just us moms. Uh, it's not gender specific, and it isn't with you either, my, my good sir. Um, you're a wonderful dad and grandpa. Um, and uh, one of the things that we hear way too much as parents, and I, as whichever parent is the primary t caretaker, here's it the most, usually in school conferences, you've got to learn to let go. I've always fantasized that some social worker would say that to me while I was holding their hands over the John Hancock building over the side, and I'd say, you're right, and I'm letting go. Um, there's nothing I liked more than when I was able to start letting go. There was nothing more joyous, and there was nothing more terrifying. Um, throughout her schooling experience, we had to involve tutors for subjects she was having trouble with. She was brilliant in some subjects, didn't seem to be able to learn others. Um, and we tried to keep her around peers who were friendly and would give her some good feedback when she was not being cool. And, and we did that. And um, she had great teachers who were creative. All these things happened. And then we got to the end of high school and be, way before that, about her sophomore year, we started looking for a place that we thought she'd fit into. She was a terrible tester. Many brilliant people on the spectrum are terrible at taking tests, just terrible, and our daughter's one of them. Um, and so she had just abysmal SAT scores. They were just horrible. And we had to look at a college who would go beyond just the numbers and would look <coughs> at her as a student. And uh, we found that. We spent years going in, opening the door a bit, and telling them what her needs might be when she came to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we took this, this young woman who really wanted to go to college. I mean, there was no motivation tr trouble for her. She was very highly motivated to go. All of her friends were going. So she wanted to go too. She wanted to get out of that house, kiddos. She wanted out of there. Um, and so we worked very hard and the big day came. And um, we got her there. I had fought like you can't believe to convince them she needed a private room that the, you know, that the sleep problems that she had would only be as, uh, uh, I can't say it. Exaggerated. Yes. Uh, no, that's not. Thank you. Exacerbated. Exacerbated. Thank you so much. Boy, 66 is a fun age. <laughs> anyway, by, you know, a roommate coming and going and that type of thing, we figured one thing at a time. Let's get her used to one thing and we'll go to the next. And so we got her there. And we set a room up. Really, we took eight hours to set up that room. It looked like a picture of what a neat college dorm room would look like. And we went to the you know, the orientation seminars for the parents, and she went to the ones for the freshmen, blah, blah, blah. Then they had the one together, and then it was time for us to leave. We had found a senior in that college who um, knew her from high school because she had tutored her in algebra. And she had said she was willing to kind of keep an eye out for her. And so we had placed her in a dorm on the same floor as this girl. And um, so we said our goodbyes and took off and it was in Rensselaer, Indiana. So we took off from the college and took the like five mile trip to the expressway. And as we were getting on, I turned to my husband and said, what do you think we are doing here? This is the stupidest idea we've ever had. Turn the car around, we're going to get her. She's gonna get lost, she's gonna get raped, she's gonna flunk out. What, this is stupid, just turn the car around, we're going back. I don't know what we were thinking. And luckily, as he does so often as we've gotten older, he totally ignored me and kept right on going. <laughs> <laughs> and the tutor told us later that right after we left, and there was no more seeing the car in the distance, she had a panic attack and said, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And her words were, my mom always tells me what to do. What am I going to do? And um, she said, well, Beth, we're going to go and meet everybody and have a good time. That's what we're going to do. And off she went. And she never looked back from that point. 
um, I cannot believe how much she grew in her social abilities and her maturity and her independent skills by being in college. It wasn't an easy road. There were many bumps along that road. Um, when it got cold, uh, the girls saw her one day starting out for class, and she had to walk about a half mile to the classes. This was sort of in a farm field, you know. It was one of those Midwestern Indiana colleges. And she had on summer clothes. And they said, Beth, you're going to freeze to death in that. Go back in and change. And she did, thank God. And, and she learned more and more about adapting to what change other than, you know, when she was home and in high school, I'd say, now, Beth, it's supposed to be cold, wear, cold today. Wear something warm. Um, but she made it. She, she got there. And um, one of the things we had to do was allow her the dignity of risk. I was scared many nights. I really was. But I knew that I had to give her this chance and that it was certainly safer than just turning her out into adult life someday. And so that's where we went. And of course, I was hoping that it would help her get a job. But my advice to other families here and people on the spectrum who are looking at vocational opportunities, job opportunities, and higher education opportunities, um, find the college or vocational program or job that best fits the person with the autism spectrum difference as an individual, not, not anything else, but who they are. And is it going to serve their interests? Is it going to be too big and be too overwhelming to them or too small of a college? And then they can never step out of line without the entire college knowing. So you have to look at those things. The same with vocational schools. And is there good mentoring wherever they're going, um, et cetera? Are, you, are they going to have a job someplace where they've got, got to live a really far way away from home where getting home for holidays and things would be financially prohibitive, et cetera. Um, but look at that and, and try to help them find the right fit. And I have a handout out in the hall for people on the spectrum about how to make some of those decisions or advice for making them, not how to make them. I'm not telling any of you what to do. I hardly know what to do myself. Um, beware of programs that say, oh, well, we've helped people with disabilities for years, so don't worry about a thing. Um, Find out, have they helped people with a unique set of abilities and challenges of someone on the autism Asperger spectrum? Because if they just dealt with physical handicaps or with people who have um, straight learning disabilities, they may not be um, proactive enough to be sufficiently helpful. Um, and ask questions of many people wherever you're looking. If it's an employer, um, one of the biggest decisions you have to make is, are you going to disclose the person with Asperger's? Do they choose to disclose their disability? And if not, then you may be setting them up for a lot of misunderstandings along the way. But yet you don't want to pre-disable them and say, oh, no, look out for Johnny. You know, forget that. Johnny is a great person, and Johnny is Johnny. But the point is, if he does have difference in learning styles or social styles, try to explain them. You don't have to use a label to do that, but explain them in some way. And then be sure that you sit down with the, your loved one and talk about their strengths and weaknesses very honestly. What are the things that are hardest for you and what are the things you're best at? And make sure that those are pointed out with where they're going into their next environment. I want to say to all of you, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I have a great deal of respect for this panel um, and, and, and each of the perspectives they're going to give you. I am going to be leading a tour for adults on the spectrum to Costa Rica to a retreat there at, uh, called Leaves and Lizards. It's an organic farm and ranch near Ma the uh, Arenal Volcano in north central Costa Rica. And I do have information on that if any of you are interested. If you don't ride a horse, you might want to learn to ride a horse because they have Pirelli trained horses there. And it's so much fun to go on the trail rides. But there's hiking opportunities and incredible nature tours, etc., and all organic food. And they grow their own food on the property, including their meats. And they do have gluten-free diets available. So if anybody's interested in that, great. I have my business cards here. 
Um, okay. If you want to ask me something later. Thank okay. you so much. That's great. Thank you. myself a practitioner and uh, so it's really great to get such good ideas from all of you guys I can't wait to go back I feel a little bit overwhelmed by it too, but to go back and uh, to put these things into practice with students that we that we support um, I've been working in transition uh, for, for many years and um, I've always kept three things in mind that have, uh, I don't know, I've been the, the center of what I do. Um, that to keep transition person-centered, uh, to keep it student-directed, and based on real-life experiences. And that seems to work, and it works, uh, um, it's worked really well for us. And I want to talk about, too, um, I, I usually start out in, in, when, when students come uh, and we interview them and we, we collect their goals, ideas of, of what their main goals are. Main goals for the students and main goals for the parents. And students, they're always the same. They're always the same. Students always express their desire to connect with others, uh, to make positive contributions to the world, and to live independently. And parents express the same things. Maybe not in that same order, uh, but certainly the same things. They want their students to be happy. Uh, they want them to be connected in a, in a social way um, with people, have friends, um, and then also living independently and having a good job to support themselves is top on their list, too. Um, we ask students, too, when they come uh, to talk about, um, uh, talk about their needs and their values. And um, I use a, um, an inventory list that, they, that, that I give them. And it's always surprising to me um, what they feel like is really important to them. Uh, because they always check everything that has to do with connection. And they use words like, uh, and they, they really, they take a lot of time to do this and really think about it. Acceptance is important. Appreciation, belonging. <coughs> Communication, community, companionship, consideration, intimacy, love, self-respect, security, to know and to be known, to understand and be understood. Another thing they check is autonomy. Lots of autonomy. What's important to you? It's important to me to have a choice freedom, independence, power, responsibility, spontaneity, and humor and joy. So I, I, it's, it's hard sometimes for us because we've got two conflicting things. They want to be independent. They want to be left alone. Uh, but then there also there's this deep, deep need for uh, being connected uh, to people, uh, to each other, um, and, and to the community. Um, because a lot of times, they want it really badly, and I think you mentioned this too, Brian, uh, but they, they also resist it at the same time. Uh, so that's our challenge um, at a uh, college internship program. How do we make that happen? How do we bring that out of students, for students? Um, and I think um, how we like to do it, and, and Michael, uh, described CIP so nicely with those little, this, those little pictorial uh, uh, cues there. I like that. Um, we try to create uh, an environment that's person-centered and, and student-directed. By that I mean we really try hard to make it individual. Really try hard to make it individual. And sometimes it drives everybody crazy in the national office because we try so hard to make it individual but and we really feel like that's important because everybody that comes in is different um, and we also uh, try hard to make it student directed too 
and based on real life experiences. And this thing is, a, this is important, so I want to spend some time talking about this because we don't often think about this too much in transition, um, is looking at the environment and how can we make those connections with the community so that students can have really real experiences and connect with, uh, uh, make the connections that they need to connect with um, to experience success. Um, so we really make an effort to shift away from, um, from the in-house and classroom instruction only. We don't make that, that we, we do a lot of instruction in, in, in the classroom, but we don't want to make that the center of what we do. Uh, we want to take that skill acquisition away from the center into real life. Uh, and so my question is always, uh, uh, how can, uh, the question is always, can you succeed in the community? You're taking this skill, how can you use it in the community? Uh, because that's where the real learning takes place. It's hard for them to generalize these, uh, a, a lot of these skills that they're using. So we really try to push them into the community and I think CIP as a whole is um, making an important uh, uh, move towards this and the Making It Real um, initiative. And REALS is an, acro an acronym for uh, Ready for Employment and Academics, Ready for Employment, Academics, and Life. And um, I don't know, it's, it's uh, I think that Bloomington as an environment is a pretty easy place to make all this happen. And I don't know if people are, are familiar with Bloomington or not. Uh, but it's kind of an unusual city um, in that it's, there's, a, there's a huge university there, uh, so we feel the presence of the university, but there's all, it's also a small town. Um, and so it's also, um, uh, there's a history of autism support there. So the whole community is familiar with, uh, uh, with, with some of the challenges that our students face. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, a school community that supports autism. I think per capita, uh, the Bloomington Monroe, Monroe County Schools supports more students with autism than any other place in Indiana. Um, and they do it quite gracefully, too, uh, using best practices, especially in the field of transition. Um, so I think that it's, oh, and then also the Bloomington community itself. Um, has a history of lifelong learning. Um, so if you can't get it from the community college, or you can't get it from the university, uh, there are a ton of, uh, uh, a ton of, of, of certifications that you can get from the city of Bloomington to help move forward um, in your, your, your quest for independence and connections. Um, so we do this in three ways. Um, uh, we try to create a, a community based on individual skills, increasing, uh, building on students' strengths, teaching them new habits and routines, and letting go of what's not working. And then we do this in, in this uh, uh, place of support, security in our own CIP community, uh, facilitating discussions about issues that the students are facing, uh, students support each other and they mediate uh, uh, problems that, that, that occur. Um, so it's a, it's a nice secure environment to, to, to get the, get the uh, conversation started. And then we look for ways to strengthen community by, by building connections out in, by building connections academically. And uh, we have the opportunity to work with you at Indiana University, along with uh, 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 Ivy Tech Community College, and then the Bloomington uh, community itself. We have lots of opportunities uh, to, for employment, um, and then independent living. There are community classes, tons of clubs that students can belong to, uh, and then fostering relationships beyond CIP too. Uh, and I think that that's part of the transition process, too, uh, is that not everybody's going to stay in Bloomington. So we try to connect them up with people like you, uh, who they can go back to their community and, uh, uh, and have uh, 
uh, people to support them there. And I think it's really encouraging. It must be encouraging for you to sit out there and be from the Chicago area and, um, and have all these people that you can turn to. And I think there's a lot more of you out there too. So there's a lot going on in your area uh, that you can pull from too. Um, and I just wanted to end, I'm not going to talk too much longer, uh, but with, uh, well, well we, we, we had an interview the other day, and a student, um, one of the student ambassadors came in and talked to a student, and uh, he, the, the, the student who was interviewing said, well, you know, I'm really not sure what I want to do. I don't know if I, I, I want to go to a big university. I don't know if I want to go to a small community college. I don't even know what I want to do. Um, and so he said to him, well, don't feel bad if you don't know exactly what you want to do, uh, because most college students are. Don't. They come here and, uh, uh, and they try a lot of different things. And he went on to say that he just read an article in the New York Times saying that the 30s are like the new 20s, and uh, the 20s are now considered the transition years. Um, and that made him feel better. He was very encouraged by this because he felt like, well, gee, I've got a chance. You know, I'm 23 now. I've got seven more years to, to, to really uh, uh, practice this. And so, I mean, it was encouraging to him, but maybe not so encouraging for parents who, again, want to see their adult children in and out and employed in, you know, a four or five year time frame. Um, but I, I can tell you that it, it doesn't happen that quickly. And uh, it takes a lot longer for, for them really to be ready to step out on their own. Um, and so transition is not so much about sprinting to the finish, finish line. Uh, and the wisest approach is to plan early, uh, think holistically. And uh, you know, you, you got a lot of ideas here, and a lot of these ideas we try to put into practice too at CIP. Uh, we have a lot of different areas that we cover. Uh, so thinking holistically is really important. Uh, thinking in terms of broadening the community connections. Uh, exploring, I can't forget about this, I tell every parent, don't forget about uh, uh, exploring the government funding services like SSI, um, vocational rehabilitation, uh, food stamps, uh, re uh, subsidized housing. All these things are going to help students be more independent and feel a sense of independence on their own. And lastly, remember to think positive and prepare not for a sprint, but for a marathon. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well, I want to thank all the infrastructure and support that they made through high school. And then, unfortunately, some of them went to very good colleges and then bombed out. And um, the parents then call me and are like, okay, so now what, right? So I think what I and the therapists who work with me um, like to ask the question, where do we go from here, okay? Um, so we're committed to helping individuals on the spectrum um, define their goals and develop resources both within our clinic and outside the community. We have a lot of resources to help them create a meaningful life. And I say meaningful life in that we try to um, challenge the assumptions of some of our clients who are like, I can only work if I'm doing X career. I can only do this if I'm doing X. And we say, well, why can't you get a part-time job um, and do some community outreach, you know, tutoring while you're working on your resume for your ultimate career. Um, and many of them, you know, this is like a new way of thinking. So I really think we work with families very much and we work with individuals. We help parents because we have so much experience through the developmental, you know, looking at the development over the 
lifespan of individuals, starting from very young children who are diagnosed to, uh, most recently I've been working with a 35-year-old lawyer who's been referred by his human resources because he doesn't deliver messages very fr in a friendly manner. Um, but he's great in the courtroom. So we try to help parents redefine expectations. Many of them who come to us after their child bottomed out um, of, of higher education are just like, wait a minute, we have a paradigm. They have to sort of adapt a paradigm shift. Um, up until that point, they were you know, falsely led to believe that academic success was the biggest predictor of outcome. And we have to talk about the importance of adaptive functioning, social functioning, and academic functioning. And that um, it's okay to be smart, but it's not gonna really get you out the door and get you to classes on time, get you to work on time. Um, so we really talk about what it means to be a full life and to work with families as early as we can on transition so they're not the ones coming in at 22 years of age um, whose parents are shocked that they couldn't make it in higher education with very bright IQs. So I think one of the things we do is we try to help our clients develop a roadmap, so to speak. Um, define goals. We're not into prolonged, you know, psychodynamic treatment. We're into um, using a pragmatic approach um, of having them identify their strengths, really understand how their brain works, both strengths and challenges, and figure out what they like, what they're good at, so we can work from a strengths background and also understand more clearly you know, the roadblocks. Um, is it their executive functioning? Is it their conversational skills? Is it their tone of voice? So we do a lot of video work. Um, helping clients see you know, how they are in, in the context of interacting with others. Um, and we help them develop realistic goals. Um, I think one of the nicest things we've done in adjunct to working with young adults and sort of career counseling is that we have three wonderful adult social groups where I'm happy to say we've um, had a burgeoning love relationship that they just celebrated their first year <laughs> together. So um, we are making connections. They do things outside of our groups together. Um, we frequently visit um, sort of job opportunities in the city, job fairs. Um, we help them develop a support system so that it isn't just their therapist, it's so that they can begin to support one another. Um, some of our clients who are further along in this journey who've you know, made transitions, sort of reevaluated themselves, let go of maybe you know, some unrealistic expectations, um, are able to provide support for our new members who are coming in and are like, what is wrong with me? You know, how come I had this ADHD diagnosis with anxiety and yet I have all of these other you know, challenges and I'm not going where I need to go? And a lot of it is working with parents and sort of redefining expectations. You know, some of our parents were like, they didn't have their child work. They didn't have them volunteer in high school. And so they make it through a four-year college and then all of a sudden they have no idea to interview. One of them, we were practicing interviewing and the young man said, well, I don't know if I can come at that time. I'll have to ask my mother. And, and I told them, you know, we need to be flexible. This isn't about your mother. So helping parents kind of help support us and navigate, you know, navigate this process and be like, okay, you know, it's okay to be like this. There are so many of you like it in the community have been very misunderstood. So helping them feel supported and appreciated um, and providing, you know, a roadmap so that they can begin to make you know, really significant um, inroads into developing what it means to be a meaningful life. You know, beyond, um, so I'm going to work part-time four hours a week and spend the rest of the time online. Um, and many of them say, you know, I don't need your social group. And then many of them are the ones that keep coming year after year after year because they underestimated, you know, or weren't really aware of how lonely they were. Um, 
We've also partnered with uh, a company in town that's called KKM Marketing, and um, we've been able to provide some part-time jobs for our clients, um, doing data hygiene and computer work at home. Um, we, we help them identify their strengths, what they're best at, and um, help them make a plan, and sort of a whole life plan is our goal. Um, So I want to just briefly talk about some of our other programs. Um, sociability, I started out um, working for Catherine Lord and actually had Beth, <laughs> Susan's daughter, as was um, her first job when I was there. And we started running social groups. And as an out, outreach of that, now we have something called activity clubs which are based on um, some of our, the interests of our young people. We have a live action role play. We have um, some cartooning and anime workshops that are our activities. In addition to that, we have a mentor program where we are training um, college students in the community in social thinking and supervising them and having them meet with some of our clients in the community um, so that they can generalize these skills because we all know the more practice you know these are muscles that are that are not you know it's not comfortable for them so we work on working in different environments with different individuals we have several actors who work with us um, we found the value of improv and working on theater skills is a way for them to be less self-conscious and some of our younger kids get to feel like they get to be a movie star rather than focusing on the fact that they're not good at eye contact. Um, so we've had a lot of success with some of our, um, our theater groups. Um, and in addition, we do you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and assessments. It's amazing how many calls I'm getting. And I think a new area that is starting is I'm gonna probably start seeing some couples um, where there's a lot of communication challenges between the couples. They feel misunderstood, resentments build up, and I think we can, I can really help clarify and help them develop some um, better understanding um, so that they can also help their child. Um, so with that, I'll pass. Thank you. Um, I started uh, in 2004 uh, with a boy named Joseph, and he could not skip. And I had no idea, his parents didn't tell me that he, had, he was on the spectrum or anything. So uh, I truly saw him, and still to this day, see all these kids for their capabilities and not their disabilities. And I taught Joseph to skip, and again, that was in 2004, and now... Going, I think this is on my ninth year. Uh, I am invested in this community. Um, your children, adults, teach me every day. They challenge me to be at my best. Um, so I thank you for that. So I hope that I could uh, share some of what I've seen success in with a lot of individuals from young um, to now I'm working with some individuals who are in their 50s um, and how exercise is so powerful um, for them. Um, I was a paraprofessional. Uh, I've changed diapers on kids from three and a half all the way to 17, just so you get a little bit more of my background um, as well. So I've, I've seen it. I've seen a lot. I haven't seen it all, um, but there's a little bit more of, of, of what I've done. I've worked at a school for children with autism and, and been in all the therapies and seen music, speech, OT, everything. And I've learned from every professional as well. And we are gonna to continue to learn, everyone here, everyone out there, um, of how to help our children and adults. Um, exercise is so vital for not only our children, our, our adults, but also for us as parents, or I should say you as parents, I'm not a parent, um, but it's, it's vital. Um, there's not a lot of research, but there is research out there for children and adults with autism. It calms behaviors, increases attention span, it can reduce stress and anxiety and improve sleep, okay? And the list goes on and on. I can t tell you about this all day. But again, remember, it's 
while there's not that much research there on specifically children with autism, look at the child or the adult first and the autism second. We know exercise is important and we should all be doing it. And as parents, um, some of you don't know where to get started or how to encourage our kids. We keep talking about you know, educating them or letting them be free or, or do it. Maybe it is an individual in the community that can motivate your child to exercise or maybe it's you. Okay, we often want to talk the talk, but we need to be able to walk the walk and, and show your child that why exercise is important. Um, and, and with some of the dads and parents and homes I go into, I'm showing mom and dad exactly what we're doing. So maybe one day when mom's had a stressful day, she can go down to the basement, do something on her own in hopes that maybe Rachel or Bill will follow mom or dad along and do that exercise with them. So I'm a big, big proponent of as parents, we gotta we gotta kind of lead them to this physically active lifestyle. Sometimes, yes, they don't want to hear it, um, but then you may have to reach out to maybe it's a neighbor next door. That's really how I got started. Is it was a dad who I was training, and he said, "Can you work with my son?" That was Joseph, and now nine years later, this is thankfully my career. Um, you uh, you can do it at any age. Okay, um, Bill, he is 27 years old. Um, I started seeing him two years ago. His ma said he, he was big, he would play softball um, every Sunday, and he was a catcher. He couldn't, and he played in a, a neurotypical league um, with I think his cousins and whatnot, but he couldn't catch a ball. And, and I mean, he's a catcher, he's, that's what he's gotta do. So I'm like, okay, and I never worked on this specifically with him broke the steps down, worked on it, and I kid you not, and you guys will be able to see this soon, um, I'm going to have a show, it's called the, the Coach Dave Show on the Autism Channel. Um, Bill can now catch two balls at the same time while kneeling on a stability ball, completely independently. It's absolutely amazing, I get goosebumps every time I say it. I mean, uh, like I said, it, it, we filmed last uh, week again with him doing it, it's awesome. So. You can do it, uh, adults, students out there, you guys can do this. Sometimes you don't like to do it, but I promise you, it will make you feel so much better and it can just restore so much confidence in your children or in your adults or maybe the adults you're working with. Um, and the accident happened where when I started working with Bill and Rachel and all these kids, um, <clears throat> where I started wanting to develop and reach out more to to the community and how can I educate more? How can we get our kids or educate our parents that our kids need to exercise? So what I did is then start to develop this visual exercise system. And <clears throat> basically it's visuals to help our child, children communicate, which we all know is important. Um, but the stuff out there isn't exercise specific or broken down to make it successful for our kids or adults. So as, as I started cutting, laminating, doing all this stuff, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. The, uh, I can have Bill, I can have Rachel, I can have um, uh, Anthony, and all these kids do this. So that kind of led me now to what's called the Champions Program. And I have right now three champions working for me, Derek, who's 27. Um, I have Rachel and Bill, who are now on the Coach Dave show, and the show's why well, maybe titled <laughs> the Coach Dave Show, it's not about me, because when you see these two lead and teach um, completely independently, nothing is scripted, it's absolutely amazing. And they are now, can not only transition to on-screen leading, but now transition to doing some tasks to uh, getting a meaningful job. And they're, and they're gonna get a paycheck. There's a lot of programs out there that don't pay them or don't incentivize them, and it kills me. So I found a business model to say, yeah, they're gonna get paid. They need to get paid. Um, we all wanna get paid in our jobs, and same for our kids. They should not, um, in my opinion, we shouldn't have to pay all this money for our kids on the spectrum to get a job and there's no reward. Um, sorry, I just, I, I've seen it and I've seen parents been taken advantage of and it kills me. So my kids, my champions are getting paid. Um, <clears throat> the again with job opportunities, some of you parents or maybe your professionals, the audience, 
Look at those tasks that you're doing um, for your job, and you may be able to create now a meaningful job for an individual with autism. It's not just about awareness, it's really about education. Um, you, you have to educate um, yourselves and say, hey, this is something that I can give to you know, an individual with Asperger's. I, I understand the labels, and I'm not about the labels as well, but I am, um, I think it's important, in, in my opinion, to go ahead and tell a job, hey, he does have a, a, a need, a special need, and, and you've got to communicate that, because if that boss doesn't know it, then the person below him doesn't know it, and then it's all, and then you're in back in that rut, back of that circle of, how can I find him a job? I, I, I think communicating his needs um, are very important, and absolutely, it's, it's not a disability. They're fully capable of doing it, but we have to provide um, the structure, the visuals, and, and, and meet his needs, and you need to communicate as parents, whether it's to me or to an, a future employer, tell him what he needs. So, um, uh, and, and I think one thing I was saying too is you could, again, some people here can provide a job. So look at that stuff around your office um, and things, and, and that could be so impactful. Because when you see these kids do what they can do, um, be challenged, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And as parents, I, I know you know that. Um, and again, with, this, with these champions, what, what, what I would see even at one of the schools I used to teach with, um, was that, you know, sometimes they would shred paper. And great, I mean, I guess some kids maybe stimmed off it, maybe they liked it, but I thought they were fully more capable than shredding paper. And that's kind of the model that I use uh, today with anyone that's coming to work for me who's neurotypical, explaining what we're doing. Um, we're not shredding paper. My champions are not shredding paper at the Exercise Connection. They're shredding expectations. So, um, if you want to talk to me after, that'd be great. If not, no big deal. Um, I do have books, I have DVD on the website, and uh, I will be presenting more on exercise and how I, and also how I broke down jobs at a conference uh, with Brian King, will be there as well, um, in the Grange, uh, St. Patty's Day. So, come out, then you can go out to St. Patty's Day stuff later, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm.